Are we live? Yep. Good morning. Uh, it is 9 o'clock. We are ready for church this morning. It is um, uh, good to have you all with us. Welcome to our Redeemer's service online, our Redeemer's Lutheran. Uh, greetings to all of you near and far who are joining us today. Uh, so good to have you with us. I'm uh, just going to do a couple announcements here. Uh, one of them we have, there's going to be an Edgeley Community Blood Drive coming here this week, August 21st, 9 a.m. to 12.15. So uh, those of you in, in the Edgeley community, in the Edgeley area, uh, please just uh, take note of that. And if you're able to give blood, contact Gloria uh, to make an appointment. And her phone number is 701-493-2053. Uh, Gloria who? Okay, just Gloria. Uh, now, uh, this is also in the bulletin, which is posted on Facebook, so you can get that announcement, or I'm sure there's uh, bulletins hung up around the community uh, with that same announcement. Uh, also, I just wanted to make mention that uh, um, as far as, far as this, the church uh, service goes and things like that, uh, as we said, we're until, uh, until school gets started and we all see how things kind of unfold with the with the pandemic and, and things like that, um, we are going to continue our services here online for the next uh, few weeks for sure. And then we're going to reassess at that point and, and ask ourselves the question of, of what's going to be best for uh, the church going forward. However, I did want to say that we're also um, having conversations about um, doing, if, if for some reason church needs to continue to be held uh, in a virtual setting, uh, we are going to look into options of doing some kind of Sunday school as well in a virtual setting and confirmation. So just keep your eyes and ears open to um, developments and ways in which we're going to try and navigate this with Sunday school and, and confirmation and pre-confirmation as well. Um, I don't really have any details on that. I just kind of wanted to put that seed um, in people's minds so that you could be thinking about that uh, going forward here in the next uh, couple of months. Okay, so uh, prayer concerns, there, there are no prayer concerns that um, we are adding uh, as far as um, individuals go. We just do wanna, w want you to take some time to look through uh, these prayer concerns throughout the week, and please keep each and every one of these people in your prayers. Uh, also, though, we do want everyone to be praying for uh, leaders and, um, in, in, in school districts and things like that that are, are reopening schools and we just uh, we want to be praying for a safe restart uh, for all the kids and families involved in that as well. So uh, those that's gonna that's gonna do it for the announcements today um, and uh, when we get to the prayers prayer times I'll include uh, each of the individuals that we're praying for as well um, but for now that's that's all that I have and uh, with that, we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to start with the brief order of confession and forgiveness, and if you do have your green hymnal, that can be found on page 56. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. 
Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Uh, at this time, we'll do our hymn of praise. Um, and we're going to be doing uh, one that we've done one other time this uh, sp earlier this spring, All Creatures of Our God and King, one of my favorite um, worship songs. And that can be found on page 527, 527 in the Green Hymnal. Um, I'll have the worship team come forward, please. Do you want to sing? Sorry, you guys. We didn't find this ahead of time. So we got to find it now. Oh. 
opportunity to sing aloud with us when we are singing because sometimes you forget how much that changes your kind of perspective and your posture on a Sunday morning with the Lord. I know that it surprised me just now. I really needed to sing. So it's great. It's the power of worship. Mm -hmm. All right. So at this time, we'll go to the prayer of the day. Uh, that is um, in, in the bulletin again. If you don't have it, just you can just listen and join along in the spirit. Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all of those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, um, we're going to have the readings here this morning. Our first Bible reading. Uh, I believe Sarah can you read it? It's all me this morning. So get ready. Okay. Our first reading today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter fifty six verses 1 and 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Also, the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, Yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. Here ends the reading. Our psalm today is chapter 67 of the psalms. It's the entire chapter. God be gracious to us and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us. That all the ends of the earth may fear him. Here ends the reading. And now we'll go to Romans. The second reading is Romans chapter 11. Verses 1 through 2a and 29 through 32. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of, of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, for just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so those also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Here ends the reading. <clears throat>
Today's Gospel is from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 15, beginning in verse 10. After Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles. This defiles the man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind, and if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, Well, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those are those things which defile a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanderings. These are the things which defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands, that does not defile a person. This is, sorry, this is the gospel of our Lord. I've got so many papers in my Bible here. Uh, the Gospel reading today, uh, there was another portion which was um, almost an entirely different, like, an entirely different reading. Um, but my message is based on this first part of the reading, and so that's all that I read. Um, and I just wanted to take some time here this morning. Just hold on one second. Better find my find my place. Uh, so anyway, uh, what I was saying is, I just want to take some time to sp to spend with the gospel reading uh, because it's one of those it's one of those what I think is really a fundamental uh, a fundamental framing uh, in our faith. That is so critical to understand. You know, for, for, for Jesus, in the context in which he's speaking here, uh, many of the times that Jesus is speaking, he's coming into confrontations with these Pharisees. And the Pharisees at the time were a, a, a Jewish sect, a, a group of Jewish people who, who really focused on the law. And what they did uh, was really what they, they valued those things which were visible over those things which were perhaps, you could say, the invisible components of faith. So the reason they valued, they, they, they lifted up the sort of legal uh, component of the Jewish faith was because there was always a visible outworking of how religious they were, how much faith they had. And the truth is, I, I don't think that we can just look at the Pharisees 2,000 years ago and say, well, yeah, people back then didn't get it. I think that I think that as we really think about what happens in this story and Jesus' encounter with these Pharisees here, uh, that we can be challenged and, and driven deeper into our faith, really to consider the role of the heart in our faith. And so the title of my message today is The Heart of Faith. Because I really do think, as I said, this is a fundamental um, aspect of our understanding of the Christian life. And it's easily, uh, the Christian life and the religious life more generally, is easily manipulated into being something that, as long as we look religious, as long as we're doing certain religious things, 
well then surely we must be we must be doing what we're supposed to do and surely other people will recognize that we're and, and, and the truth is that is so dangerous it's so dangerous and, and I'll tell you why that's dangerous here in a moment we'll get to that but I also want to say by way of introduction that what Jesus is doing here in this specific scenario, what we see playing out in his encounter with the Pharisees, is really a making explicit of what was implicit in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' big message sermon that he gives in the Bible, and we see, we see the whole thing, well, Matthew's large version of it in Matthew, and then we see a smaller portion of it in Luke. But what's always happening in the Sermon on the Mount, and what a theme is, is that Jesus is driving not against the law, but beyond the law to the heart. And so what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, and just one example, is when Jesus says, it says in the law, do not murder your brother. But then Jesus says, but I say, if you have hate in your heart towards your brother, you have already committed murder. Right? So what's he doing here? Well, he's constantly backing up. He's constantly going deeper and de demonstrating to us this sort of reality that what stands at the heart of our faith, what stand, I'm sorry, what stands at who we are as individuals in our life, what stands at the center of that, what is at the root of that, is the precondition of our heart. I'll say that again. What stands at the root of who we are, ultimately, how our lives unfold, what the words are, as Jesus said, the words that come from our the come from our mouth, the actions which come from our body, the life that we live, what stands at the heart of that is the precondition of our heart. You know. As far as faith goes, we can have all kinds of faith. We can have an intellectual faith where, you know, we, we have all of the proofs that God exists. We have all of the sort of logic put together in our own, in our own sort of mind, what we've learned in school. And, that this, and because we've done this, logically, it makes sense that God is real, that Jesus is was real, that there is a historical reality, and so we can have an intellectual faith. But that faith isn't enough. That's not the kind of faith God is after. We can have a moral faith, right? We can, we, we can look at the Bible and we can scan it for all of those external realities of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And we can just make sure we look like But that isn't it either. That's not the point. You see, ultimately, what we come to find is that what stands at the heart of our faith is what Jesus refers to as our heart. The deepest part of who we are. Right? The deepest part of who we are. It's an interesting... Um, uh, I did a very pastoral thing in my in my message today, and Sarah's going to love this. Um, so I got three points, and uh, each point uh, has two words, and each word starts with the same letter. <laughs> See, she even she even gave me a little laugh. Mm -hmm. But it, it just it just it just came to me like um, like like it was meant to be. So I got to go with it. <laughs> And, and it'll be more memorable. So the heart of faith, there's three aspects to it. There's, when, we can, when, we can, when we're concerned with the heart of faith, that is, our heart in our faith, we recognize that there is a deeper diagnosis to the problem. Right? Sarah's winking at me. She's thinking this is... There is a transformative treatment. Ooh. And there is a perfect prognosis. Yes. Let's, here. Come on, some applause from the crowd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Deeper diagnosis, transformative treatment, and perfect prognosis. I thought this would this is 
And honestly, I, I, I say this not jokingly. These are this is this is very much uh, gets at the heart, no pun intended, of what I'm trying to say. So first of all, what is the deeper diagnosis um, when we're looking at the heart of faith, the deeper aspects of faith? Well, in today's gospel, um, I started in verse 10, but I really want us to go back to verse 8. Because in chapter 15, verse 8, right before where I started reading, we see these words. And this is Jesus, um, uh, this is Jesus quoting Isaiah, right? So he says, uh, I'm going to go actually back to um, verse 5. He says, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother. And by this, you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Now listen to that. You invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And then Jesus says, you hypocrites. And then he says, the prophet Isaiah wrote, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Of course, then in verse 10, one verse later, Jesus says, he says to the crowd, hear and understand, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man, but what proceeds from the mouth. This defiles a man. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth um, goes into the stomach and is eliminated, but the things that proceed from the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. The deeper diagnosis, right, that Jesus is, Jesus is identifying this hypocrisy in the Pharisees where they can say with their lips, hey, um, uh, you know, or, I'm sorry, they're saying with their lips that the problem is that people are eating the wrong foods. They're doing the wrong thing. Like they're taking things in, but what actually comes out of their lips, what actually comes out of their mouth, reveals what's in their heart. And God says that the problem, the deeper diagnosis, and, and, and really what you could say in terms of church language, the sin, the deeper sin, the, the, the aspect of, of, of brokenness that we experience in our life, the fact that um, this is something common to all human beings, this deeper diagnosis comes to us in verse 8. When, G when, when Jesus quotes Isaiah and says, This people honors me with their lips, but what? But their heart is far from me. You know, the reason we're broken, the reason we're confused, the reason we are lost, the reason, the reason we can wander aimlessly through this life, isn't that we haven't figured out how to become moral enough. It isn't that we haven't figured out how to logically understand God how to logically explain God, and things like that. It's because our hearts are far from God. Right? That's the deeper diagnosis that Jesus finds. That's in, 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 in terms of the problem. Um, but then there's a transformative treatment. You know, we understand the gospel to be uh, that which is God's response to this brokenness. God's response to us being far from Him is for Him to come close to us. For a God who is the creator of the universe, who is not a human, to become human in the person of Jesus Christ, to come close to us because we are far from Him. And we talk about this in terms of salvation, in terms of Christ's death on the cross, which becomes that moment in which he deals with all of the darkness, all of the brokenness, and all of the sin that exists. But we oftentimes also we stop there and we say, thank God, thanks be to God, right? Thanks be to God for what Jesus did on the cross. But what Jesus did on the cross is the beginning of what God wants to do in us. It is the beginning of God's desire for us to be transformed. To not simply be converted, 
to not simply become believers so that when this life is over, we have eternal life, which is the promise in Christ, of course, but rather that even now we are being transformed day by day. In Romans, Paul writes about this, saying, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and hold, uh, sacrifice, holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now keep that, keep that verse in mind. 2 Corinthians then, Paul also writes this. Second Corinthians 3, chapter 3, verse 18. We have this. <clears throat> now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory unto glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. All right, so at the heart of our faith is a diagnosis that our heart is far from God. But secondly, is a treatment that is transformative. Not a band-aid, not a not even a heal, not not even a just a healing, but a healing and more. A transformation, right? That God desires us as Christians, as those of people of faith, to be transformed into the image of Christ. That's what he says in, in, in when I just wrote, wrote uh, read. 2 Corinthians, from glory unto glory we are being transformed into the image of Christ. And then thirdly, we have the deeper diagnosis, the transformative treatment, and a perfect prognosis. Now you hear me say that word perfect and you're probably like, Ugh, what's this going to be? I don't like the word perfect. I think that I'm a perfectionist and it's caused me much misery in my life um, and continues to cause me misery. And being a perfectionist doesn't mean I do things perfectly. It just means that I'm always hard on myself because I never do things perfectly. And so I don't like the word perfect and probably most people don't like the word perfect because um, mostly because of how we define it. Uh, in English, perfect is kind of this moral quality. It's like without blemish, right? So we think of perfect as being something, when I say, oh, it's perfect, it means it's like there's no problem. There's no, there's no like, uh, there's no blemish. And so we, we think of it morally. We think of it competitively. We think of it in sports. We think of it in performative ways. Like if you perform a piano piece perfectly, like that's what you really want. Really? I mean, like, so we get this sort of taste in our mouth. So we read then in the Bible that Jesus was perfect. And we immediately think, well, it must mean that when Jesus plays the piano, he never makes a mistake. I, got this, I just keep saying piano because the piano came. Yeah. So we have this idea of perfect in the English language. That is very unhelpful for when we read about this word perfect in the Bible. And the word perfect in the Bible comes from the Greek word telos, and there's different forms of it. But it means more specifically, more clearly, maybe more, more, more uh, definitively, it means um, complete. Having reached its end. Right? Having reached its completeness. So perfect prognosis. What do I mean by that? Well, I think that as we grow in our faith, we are not becoming more perfect in the sense that we think of it. 
but rather we are becoming more perfected as God is completing his work in us. And sometimes God's work is completed through our imperfections. Like God's work is even most clearly seen sometimes when our, the reality of our imperfection is most obvious. Right? Perfect prognosis. Now, Philippians 1.6 captures this, I think, um, perfectly. Wow. <laughs> um, Philippians 1.6, uh, really one of my favorite verses. It's, it's a verse that I think is, is important to have on your fridge to remember what God is doing in you. And, and Paul writes, um, I always remember... I always offer prayer with joy in you for in my every prayer, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Um, think of that. Now, that's not the verse really I wanted to read, but I just want to pause there. Your participation in the gospel. That, that, that we, we so quickly want to say, well, this is, this is them, you know, evangelizing. No. Paul here is talking about participating yourself in the good news of the gospel, participating in the story of God. Like, we are part of the story of God. And that's why then he can go on to say in verse 6, For, therefore, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. He who began a good work in you. If God has begun something in you, we can know that our prognosis is perfect. That if God has begun something in you, He is going to complete it to perfection. And I love this because this verse brings together this idea that it is, the word perfect and the word complete really in the Greek means the same thing. It means the same thing. And that's why then when I was reading Romans 12, I said to remember that verse when I was talking about the transformation component of the Christian faith, like how it's something more than just believing and somehow thinking that it's a transactional thing. But in Romans where I read in chapter 12, Again, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You see, the will of God, the will of God is a perfect prognosis that he, whatever he desires to do in us, will be done. And through our imperfection, and through the life, the ups and downs of life, and through the struggles, I believe, these are the very components which God uses, these very imperfect components God uses to bring us to complete His will in us completely, in that sense, to bring it to perfection in Him. And so this is the heart of faith. The heart of faith is much deeper than what the Pharisees often saw as just the outward expression of it, what it looks like. But rather, it's about what's going on in the heart. Is our heart near to God or far from God? What's going on in the transformation of our, of our life, of our experience, of our actions, of our words? And ultimately, do we recognize that God is doing a work in us that He will bring to completion? This is the heart of the Christian faith. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you today for uh, these words uh, from Jesus in the gospel. These words which remind us that, that though so often we as humans want to, to uh, manipulate our faith in a way that, that, that we can be sure that, that we're in control, that, that we can demonstrate to others that, yes, we're, we have faith, that we can externally prove our faith like we are so tempted to do this as human beings yet lord god 
we see that really at the heart of it, that you care about the heart, that you care that our heart is near to you, that you care that transformation is happening in our life, and that you care that we have a trust and a faith and a belief that you are taking us, that what you began, the good work that you began in us, that you will bring to perfect completion. And we thank you for this now in Jesus' name. Time for a song again. Mm. Um, so we're going to do the hymn of the day now. <clears throat> it's, it's not a hymn, it's a worship song. Uh, Lord, I need you. This was one we did a little uh, earlier this spring as well. So we got a couple of repeats, but we've been we've been doing this for some time now that it's, it's all right. Are you going to sing with us? You do? Do you want to do your dre your twirly dress for the camera? Okay, let's see. Woo! It's beautiful. <laughs> your hair looks pretty too. All right. Rosie got this new dress from one of her aunts, and and it on a in terms of its twirliness, it's it's a ten out of ten, right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Is she? Come here, monkey. What's going on? Come here, monkey. There, that's way better. Okay, oh. you good? Yep. Can you read it, Rosa? Let's see. Start right here. Just kind of follow along with us. Can you read it? All right, sorry. Sorry. Just put your cape a little on. No, this will be fine. That's how I practice, so.
my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and worship team. This time, let's, let's join together and recite, um, confess our faith in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, let us pray. Uh, turn to the prayers of the church. Uh, I just want to mention, I do know that, la I haven't had a recent update, but last week, um, Corey Nitsky had surgery again, and so we... we, we um, we emphasize prayer for recovery for that um, as an update as well. So I'll mention as well each, each person in the prayers coming up. Uh, but let us pray for the whole people of God now and in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we do come before you today. We worship you, all creatures of our God and King. Lord God, we come before you and we give you praise. We give you praise for carrying us through difficult times. Lord, for shining your light in our life. For giving us a way forward. For revealing hope in the person of Jesus Christ. We praise you and we worship you today for uh, the sunshine for the creation around us, for friends and for family, for the care that um, the care that you show through human beings one to another. And so, God, we come before you praying for your whole church today. And today I pray, Lord God, that your church would be a witness of the importance and the value of truth would be a witness of the importance and the value of justice and integrity and honesty in a world where these things seem to be fleeting. Lord, we pray that you truly would transform the hearts and the minds of each person who calls upon you, that we might reflect your love, your justice, your generosity, your openness, your inclusion of, of each and every person that, is, that, that exists on this earth whom you have created. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I pray today for the nations. We continue to pray for 
uh, each nation's battle against the coronavirus. We pray for leadership. Lord God, we pray for healing, for, for the grieving of those who have lost loved ones. God, we pray for the healing of those who are sick, those who will become sick. We pray for protection. God, we ask for, um, we ask for wisdom for our leaders and for each of us as we navigate this difficult time. We pray for our own nation, God. As we are seeing the divisiveness which has been part of our story for a long time amplified and exponentially amplified in the past years. And it, Lord, seems like it's getting to a fevered pitch right now in such a way that it it's truly concerning. And so, God, I pray that each and every person would have the openness of mind to step back and to consider the common good, not the good for just some, but the be what's best for all. Help our leaders to do the same. Lord, help our country to have a, a safe, election season, that it would have integrity for whatever decisions are made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today also, Lord, for those who are in need. And we lift up to you Corey Nitsky and his recovery from surgery and from his terrible accident this spring. Lord, it's been such a long road. And we continue to pray for his healing and his comfort in this time of struggle. We pray for his wife, Susie, that as she is caring for him and doing extra work on the farm, that you would continue to give her the strength that she needs and the endurance. And Lord, for those who have been fighting for a long time, battles, cancer, and otherwise, for Jerry Lugadensky and Steve Lambert. Lord, we pray for Lane Froelich, Mike Berubka, Wayne Heinrich, Diane Feist. For Melissa Powers, for Helen Seafeld. Lord, we ask for continued, we ask for continued healing for each person. Bring comfort to those who are lonely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for this church, Lord God, we do thank you. We thank you that amidst the pandemic, you've continued to work, that you've continued to draw us together in this, in this format. Lord, I know it's not ideal and it's not perfect, but yet I also see that you are working, that you are doing things. And Lord, for those who've been unable to join us, we pray that your spirit would continue to work in their lives and that one day you would draw us all together in person that you would continue to lead this church through this time and beyond. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please receive this final blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a great week and be safe, be healthy, and hope. hopefully we'll see you back next week. Take care.